I want to thank you all for being here this morning. It is an exciting day of celebration for what the Lord has done in the life of a family and the life of a young one. I know there's a lot of people here, a lot of, a lot of family, uh, some new faces, some I don't recognize, and that's okay. Uh, welcome. I'm glad you are here to celebrate what God has done in the life of Layden. And he is going to be, he's going to be baptized this morning. And uh, man, it's exciting. I'm excited because I I'm, almost got the whole family. I wasn't there for the baptism of Robbie or Allison, but I did baptize Riker. Now I have the privilege of baptizing his brother this morning. It's exciting. Because we see, we see growth in the church, and it's not always meant in numbers. That's not how we measure the growth in the church. That's not how we measure the wealth of a church. What we measure it by is the growth in the individuals. This, this place could be empty, save for maybe three people. And if I knew that in those people was the power of God and the presence of God and the Holy Spirit, then I know that this church is rich and this church is wealthy. And that's what matters, is the growth of the individual. And in the individual, we see growth. We see the growth of the church and the growth of God's Word. A few weeks ago, we began a sermon series called Not Ashamed. We looked at how we are not to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. There should be no offense that we find in Jesus Christ whatsoever. Last week, we looked at, we looked at His Word, how we are not to be ashamed of His Word, that we are to speak it boldly. Uh, we are to receive it and accept it. See, there in Matthew 11, verse 6, Jesus says to those who are doubting if He is the Messiah, or for those that have placed Jesus Christ in a box of their own expectation, He is saying to them, look and see what I have done as the Messiah. Look at what the Messiah is doing. Jesus says, look at what I am doing. And that's what we're going to examine this morning. We're going to examine the work of Jesus Christ. And how we should find no offense in His work. How we should not be ashamed of the work of the cross. So if you would, please turn to 1 Corinthians. is where we'll be this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This morning we'll be looking at verses 18 through 25. Before, before, while you guys are turning there, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. It's also going to be up on the, on the wall here. Pete, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And now the church in Corinth have been known for being trouble. They have been known for being difficult. Now what the church in Corinth, the people of Corinth, have always been known for is that they are imitators and they want to be bigger than Rome. It is there in Corinth that we see that they do have a lot of money. They do have a lot of riches. That it is one of those cities that many would go to on their way to Rome or from Rome to Jerusalem. So within Corinth there were many Greeks there were many Hellenistic Jews, and those were the Jews that took on the culture of the Greeks, those of Rome. And there were many Orthodox Jews that were there too. And Paul has planted a church in Corinth. And what we find is that they have been divided amongst themselves of who they are to follow. They have been divided amongst themselves of who it is whose teaching and whose wisdom they will follow. Some of them say, I follow, or I am of Paul. And so that sect of people, that section of people is a good word, that division of people there, say that I am of the teaching of Paul, I follow Paul. And so they would have been Paulian, I guess. And then some of them also say, well, you know, I don't follow the teaching of Paul. And this is a really passive way of saying it. What they say is, I am of Apollos. So I guess that those people would Apollo, uh, Apollosian. But then some of them are like, hey, you know what? I don't follow Paul. I don't follow Apollos or their teaching or their wisdom. What I do instead is I follow Cephas. Now, Cephas can also be translated as Peter. Or that's the name that's given to Peter by Jesus Christ. So they could be Cephasian or they could be Peterian. But then some of them say, no, I am of Jesus and I follow the wisdom and I follow the teaching of Jesus Christ. Christ. So they would have been Jesusian? No. Christian. Christian. I am of Christ. That's what we are to say this morning too. If we are believers in this place, what we don't do is we don't say, well, I follow the teaching of Tip, so I'm Tippian. That sounds bad. <laughs> 
now that I hear it out loud. Do not say that, please, for many reasons. Or I follow the teaching, I am of John MacArthur. There's a famous pastor that is still alive today. Or I am of Graham, Billy Graham. I am of Billy Graham, who's no longer with us. Or I am of Charles Stanley, and he's no longer with us either. Or I am of, and you can just fill in the blank. That's what we find ourselves doing. That's what the Corinthians were doing as well. Well, I'm not going to go to your church. I'm not going to visit your church because they're heathens. It's a Methodist church. And they are of the devil. Or I'm not going to go to your church because of the way they see baptism. I'm not going to church of Christ. Some people say that. Now, why are we divided? We divide ourselves because of denomination. We divide ourselves because we choose this doctrine over this doctrine. And it does get really fuzzy. And it does get really deep in the weeds. That I am not going to go to your church because of the way you do baptism. Because you don't do the sprinkling or because you don't baptize infants, but you baptize adults and it's full immersion. We're not, no, I'm not part of that. I am of this church instead. And, and Paul asks the question, is Christ divided? Now, we all can answer that question, right? Amen. Is Christ divided? Absolutely not. Amen. Then why do we divide Him? Christ is not divided, and what we do is we divide ourselves. We fall into that same trap that the Corinthian church fell into also, if we want a technical term for it, secretarianism. I'm not going to follow that wisdom. I'm not going to follow that teaching because I follow Paul instead. No, Paul is ashamed of that. No, you don't follow me. You follow the teaching of the one who taught me. Amen. Be imitators of Paul. Paul would even say that. Be imitators of me. Do as I do. But what he is saying then is he is saying, I imitate Christ. So if you are imitating Paul, then you are imitating Christ. No, we are not to be divided. We are to be one, unified as the body of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if the body loses one of its limbs, it cannot function the way that it is meant to function. And that's where we come to this morning's scripture. Is Christ divided? We know the answer. The answer is no. And so then Paul begins to preach to them and to us this morning about the wisdom of man. So if you would, follow along with me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18-25. through 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand, a sign, demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let us go to the Lord this morning in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be humbled by the fact that we have your very word in our midst. And let us not take for granted this moment that we have to gather together to hear your word spoken. To hear your word broadcast over your church and over the community. For those who are believers and unbelievers, together would hear the name of Jesus Christ spoken. The only name in heaven and on earth by which we are to be saved. Amen. So God, move me aside. 
may you take center stage. That we would hear your word and not the word of a fragile man. That we would hear your teaching and not the wisdom of the world. That your Holy Spirit would speak through the fully inspired and breathed out word of God that is alive and active. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to look at two different individuals here, uh, groups of individuals. We are going to look at those uh, Jewish believers and those Greek believers, also those Jewish unbelievers and those Greek unbelievers. See, Paul, Paul says in verse 17 that he has come to preach the gospel and not the wisdom of words. He has come to preach the gospel and not his own understanding, but that that has been taught to him. There was a time after Paul's uh, conversion. Now see, Paul was one who considered himself wise. There was others that would look at him and see him as wise beyond his years. He was young. And being a Pharisee, he had to know Scripture. That was one of the prerequisites that if you were going to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize the Old Testament. And that's a lot to memorize. He had to be able to, to spout it out whenever it was needed, not only in teaching, but also in defense. But for the Pharisees of that day, it was not necessarily used for teaching. Instead, it was used to keep people down, to, pe te to keep people in control, that they would have wealth and they would have prosperity. Not the people, but the Pharisees would have wealth and prosperity. And they would, they would spew their own wisdom or what they thought was their own wisdom or their own self-righteous law unto other people. And Paul was one of them. But then on that day, in Acts chapter 9, when we see Paul is on his way to Damascus, he is set on his butt, literally. There is a blinding light that is Jesus Christ that shines so brightly that Paul is blinded. And it is there that he hears the voice of truth. It is there that his heart is softened. It is there that he realizes that he is wretched and in need of a Savior. And the only one to save would be Jesus Christ. Amen. And he goes into Damascus and it is there that he finds the disciple Ananias who is there to heal him of this blindness. And after that, he is strengthened by the other disciples there and he goes into the wilderness and that is where the Holy Spirit teaches him the wisdom of God. Now, Paul had a, had a beautiful mind and a beautiful brain that he was able to absorb it in such a way that other men couldn't. And he even says that, that there, were, there was wisdom that was given to him that is extremely hard to put into human terms. But he does the best that he can. You read through the book of Romans and sometimes we're like, God, what is he talking about? This is very hard to understand. It's a very difficult book to read through. And that's why we have scholars and commentators and preachers to be there to help us to understand it. Paul had wisdom, great wisdom from God, but even here he is saying, I'm not preaching my own wisdom. I'm not preaching my own words. So when he goes into this whole thing, beginning in verse 18, that's the wisdom of God that's being preached there. And all the things that he writes, we see fully inspired and breathed out by God. It is God's word and it is scripture, how we are to live our lives. Now, if we look at the work of the cross Paul says here, the word of the cross, we would know that it is folly to some people. That means foolishness. To those who are perishing, meaning those who are unbelievers. We're looking at those two groups of individuals at this time, looking at the Jews. See, the Jews, as Paul says in verse 22, they were always looking for a sign. What is the next sign that Jesus can give us? That possibly we could believe. Is that truly what it was for? that they would even believe. And I, I think Jesus even knew. It didn't matter what He did. They were not going to believe because their hearts were hardened. But only some of them would believe that, that small few, that remnant of what once was truth would believe the signs that Jesus was showing to them that He is God. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 12 concerning this. In Matthew 12, verses 38 and 39, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. 
but no sign will be given to it except, well, there is one then, Jesus is saying, except this one sign, and that's the sign of the prophet Jonah. What in the world? They are seeking after a sign. He says, you're not going to get the one you're looking for, but you're going to get the one that you need. And it's the sign of the prophet of Jonah. Well, what did Jonah do? And we, I think we, most of us know the story of Jonah and the whale. You heard that sound. That's the sound of the buzzer saying you're wrong. Show me in the Bible where it says a whale. And I'll be proven wrong and that's okay. What we do have is the story of Jonah being swallowed by a big fish. We automatically assume the biggest fish of all, which is technically a mammal, right, is, is the whale. So we say whale for the kids to understand. That was a big fish. And it was probably a man-sized fish. And I guarantee Jonah was probably in that fish, in the belly of that fish, in the fetal position, very cramped and very tight, and it probably did not smell good. And he probably didn't have a lot of air. It was probably rough for him to be. And we think of this cute little story of Jonah and this whale, kind of like in Pinocchio, where he, Pinocchio is in that whale, Monstro, I think is the name of the, the whale or whatever that thing was. And there he is with Geppetto, and they found this ship in there. And they're able to like start a fire and everything, and it's all comfy and cozy until they're spit out or blown out by the... Come on now. It wasn't meant to be nice. It wasn't a Four Seasons hotel room. He was swallowed by a fish. And then when he realized that... When he realized... Realized? When he realized that he needed salvation... And he's crying out to God, and we read about that. And he's crying out to God for salvation. That's when he spit out onto dry land. And see, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because his enemies were there. The Assyrians were there. They had already taken over Nineveh, and he didn't want to preach to his enemies. But God had other plans for Jonah. Spit out onto dry land, and there he goes running to Nineveh doing what God was intending for him to do the whole time. And it was there in Nineveh that Jonah preached a message of repentance. Wait a minute, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yes, it does, and it should. I hope it does, because that's the same message as we read in Matthew chapter 14. That's the same message that Jesus is preaching when he comes onto the scene, preaching a message of repentance that the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Turn back from your evil ways. Repent. And this is what Jesus is preaching in the Word of God. He's preaching it not only from the Old Testament, but He's also preaching what the Pharisees weren't willing to preach. That they were wicked and they were evil and they needed salvation. But Jesus comes on the scene and He's saying, you know all this stuff that the Pharisees have been preaching to you? It's wrong. It's their own law. It's not God's law. Jesus comes onto the scene and he's saying to everyone, you have got to turn away from your evil ways or you are going to be destroyed. That was sign number one. And it was in his word. And there's another sign that is given to us, the same sign of the prophet Jonah. That Jesus begins, he, he, he continues and says in Matthew 12, verses 40 and 41, because he didn't leave them hanging. They're not like, hey, wait, 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 wait a minute, preacher. What is this sign of Jonah? Well, I'm going to tell you. Jesus tells them. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Jonah, it means that there is a movement that is happening. And there is someone greater than Jonah that is bringing in this movement. It's the movement of the kingdom of heaven. It is here. The ruling and the reigning of Jesus Christ on earth has begun. And they weren't willing to hear it. They weren't willing to receive his words. And so what he's saying to them, you're going to get a sign. I, Jesus says, I am going to be like Jonah. It's not going to be a fish. It's going to be the earth. That means I'm going to be dead. 
But on the third day, I'm going to rise. I am going to come back. I am going to walk among the living. As the resurrected Lord and Savior. As the one who has defeated death. See, Jonah died. Jonah didn't bring himself back. He couldn't. But see, Jesus died. And he did bring himself back. Because he could. He had the power to do it. Jonah didn't. Jesus had the power of the Holy Spirit that brought him back to life as a declaration that he was in the ground, in the grave, in the depths, conquering death. And this was a sign to them that they did not want to believe. For them, it was a stumbling block, is what Paul says. For the Jews of that day, even for today, they deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even though we have empirical evidence to prove it, we have the truth of God's Word to prove it, and so stumbling in their unbelief, they deny the very Word of God. For them... The word of the cross is a stumbling block. Jesus knew that it would be this way. Jesus knew. That's why we go back to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 6. We have a beatitude, a way of how we are to live our lives. John the Baptist in prison sends his own disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the one? Are you the Messiah or should we wait for another? And we see John the Baptist was placing Jesus Christ in a box of his own expectations an expectation of the Messiah to come and free the captives out of prison. And and see, John was taking that literally because he was in prison. That the bound would be unbound. That the brokenhearted would be healed. And John wanted that so severely that he sent his own disciples to question whether Jesus was the one. Now John was wanting Jesus Christ to do more. As if Jesus wasn't already doing enough. He says to the disciples of John, look, see and hear that the blind are receiving sight, that the lame are made to walk, that the deaf hear, and that the dead are raised from the dead. He is doing the work of the Messiah. Matthew 11, verse 6. Blessed are those who are not offended by me. Jesus says. So that includes his word. That includes his work. Another way of translating that is blessed are those who do not stumble on my account. Blessed are those who do not stumble on my account, Jesus says. But for those who are not willing to believe in the work of the cross... It is very much a stumbling block. And what we find, as we learned last week, is that those who are ashamed of Jesus Christ in His Word and in His work, when He comes back with His angels, He too will be ashamed of them. And for this fragile man that stands before you this morning, I would not want my Lord and Savior to come back to look upon me and be ashamed of me. I would not want that, but instead what I would want, I believe the work of the cross. I believe the word of the cross. The cross. So there is a living hope within me that when he does return, he would look upon this fragile man standing in the righteousness that is his own, standing in forgiveness and grace and mercy and the love of God, and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come home. Amen. Amen. Another group of individuals that we see here are the Greeks. Like I said, in Corinth, man, the, the Corinthians were, were really well known for being imitators of Rome. They really wanted to be like Rome in wisdom and in depravity. Uh, they were willing to be part of any sexual immorality if it meant they looked more and more like Rome. But also, man, they were made fun of a lot too because of, of, of how false they were. 
in their lives and in their living, if there was a play that would come out at that time, they would know that the, uh, like we, we have the Joker or whatever when we look at the cards, like the, the playing cards. You know, there's the Joker that we always throw out because we don't use the Joker for whatever reason. Or the Jester, uh, the one that, is, uh, that does folly before the king or the one that acts a fool. In plays, if there was ever someone introduced in a play and they were, they were uh, introduced as the Corinthian, you would know, well, that's the moron of the play. That's the, that's the, that's the idiot they, were thought, they thought they were wise, but they were, they were even foolish among men. And here David is coming, I mean not David, here Paul is coming in, correcting them about this, rebuking them about this, because they are seeking after the wisdom of man. They are seeking after wisdom because they think it will make them so much greater if they follow the teaching of Paul, or they follow the teaching of Apollos, or they, teach, they follow the teaching of Cephas instead of following the one who taught them. And what they seek after instead is their own wisdom. But here's what Scripture shows us. When we look at the Corinthians, as Paul says in verse 22, that the Greeks seek after wisdom. And we look at them as a culture, we look at them as a people. We know that they were, they saw themselves as wise in their own eyes. But then we've got scripture that goes against that worldly teaching. Uh, that whole thing of, of know thyself. Uh, and that comes from Greek philosophy. Know thyself. And then, then that, that is a revelation of what you are to be. Or that's a, a higher existence if you know thyself. But here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, deny yourself. Because if we are seeking the wisdom of man, we're seeking the wisdom of this world, or we see ourselves as wise in our own eyes, then we do not fear God. Amen. That's a very harsh thing to say. Well, hang on a minute. That's what the, one of the wisest men that ever walked the earth, that's what he said in Proverbs. And here's what he says in, in Proverbs 3. Solomon says, Proverbs 3, verse 7, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. And look, a message of repentance coming from the book of Proverbs. Don't go after wisdom of yourself. Don't go after the wisdom in your own eyes. Don't go after the wisdom of the world. Don't go after the wisdom of man. Don't go after the wisdom of the devil. Instead, turn away from that evil. It, it's also in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. That says the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. That if we are to have a reverence, a reverent respect and a reverent awe of who God is and what He says and what He does, then we would fear Him. Amen. And that is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Not anything that this world would tell you. Not anything that man would tell you. Because it all comes from one place. And that is the evil one, that is Satan, that is the devil. It all comes from one place. The wisdom of the flesh, sexual immorality. The wisdom of the world, immorality. The wisdom of Satan, he would rather you believe that you don't need God. And that's what the world will tell you, and that's what the flesh will tell you as well. That you don't need God. Or... You don't need church. I'm going to wait on that one for just a second. Because that is a lie that has been piercing the heart of this nation. That you don't need church. It is a lie. Amen. From the father of lies. Who was lying from the very beginning. Not seek after the wisdom of this world, for it is folly. Those who 
find wisdom in themselves, do not fear God. Because here's what we find is that the human wisdom will always clash with the divine wisdom. It does not go well together. And I'm not one who would stand before you and say that God is foolish. I would not ever want to say that God has been foolish or will be foolish or could be foolish. And I'm not one who would want to stand before you and say that God is weak. I would not ever want to say that God could be weak or will be weak. Because I know my strength is in the Lord. And I know that wisdom comes from the Lord, from the fear of God. Exodus 15, 2 tells us that He is our strength. But Paul says in verse 25, and this is what's so perplexing sometimes to some of us, it might be bewildering. He says in verse 25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So is, is Paul calling God foolish? Is Paul calling God weak? No. Thank you. But what man would call foolish of God is wiser than anything that man could ever think of. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that again. I know Ken got it. But I'm going to say it again for the, for the rest of the church. What man would call foolish of God is wiser than anything that man could ever think of. It would be foolish to say that God is foolish, but there are people in this world who would say that He is foolish for all of His work was done in vain. And that's what the wisdom of the Greeks would say. Or they look to the cross. It would be kind of like, kind of like me coming before you and saying that I was, I was serving this guy who came, who came to earth born of a virgin, right? And, it, and they say it's this day and age right now. And, and he said he, he needed to die, that he was going to die, but he was going to come back. And so they put him in jail, right? They put him in prison for the things that he was saying against the nation, against the country, and they saw it as treason. So he walked the one mile. He walked the green mile, right? He walked the last walk that he would ever take, we thought. And they put him in that electric chair. And for me to say, you know, my faith is in a man who went to the electric chair, and is now dead, but came back a, a couple of days later, there's a lot of people that'd be like, no, 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 no. You don't come back from the electric chair. We know what that does to somebody. I mean, you dead. There's, there's no coming back from that electric chair. I mean, some people have seen executions from an electric chair. I'm not going to go into details, but it's gruesome. There's things that the body does from electricity that's not nice. It's not good. And it's gross. Now, the people in Jerusalem who understood the Greek culture would see a man walking surrounded by Roman guards with a large beam on his shoulder and on his back. It would be a cross beam that everyone knew, oh, he's not coming back. Paraded through town with that cross beam, wearing nothing because it was meant to be shameful with stripes on his back for being beaten, walking through town. And this is just some Joe Schmo. Because the crucifixions were very popular back then. You didn't have to do much. But if you stood up to Rome or you stood against Rome, you're going to be walking through town with that cross beam on your back. They're going to put you in one of the highest places. You're going to walk up a hill outside the city. And they're going to rope you or they're going to, they're going to nail you to that cross beam. And they're going to lift you up for everyone to see your shame. What a shameful way to die. And so the people understanding this in the Roman culture are going to be like, no, that doesn't make sense to us. We've seen plenty of people walking through the city taking their last steps knowing they're not coming back from that cross. So this, does not, this, not, this reasoning in our minds, it just doesn't make sense. But here's what we know. Because this is, this is who we're going to talk about now. There's more than just two individuals, groups of individuals, that Paul lists here in 1 Corinthians. He talks about those who find the word of, of the cross to be a stumbling block, and he finds those who find the word of the cross to be fool, foolishness. But then there's believers. And there were some there that day too who watched a man 
beaten beyond even recognition, beaten to the point to where he was barely breathing, beaten to the point to where he could not carry that crossbeam any longer, wearing a purple, blood-stained robe that had been thrown on him, wearing a crown of thorns that had been smashed onto his head. And he carried that crossbeam with help up the mount. And it was there that his hands were pierced. And it was there that his feet were pierced. And it was there that what man thought was weakness was the true power of God. Because to believers, the word of the cross is power. That's what Paul says here. They would have found weakness in this, and that's what we're getting at. So when Paul says that even the foolishness of God, the foolishness of God is greater wisdom than man could ever comprehend, see, the work of the cross was greater than anything that God could, or, or man could ever comprehend. And so even the, the weakness of God, so we, he talks about that there in verse 22. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. I look back through the Bible and I don't see where God is weak. And some of them would look at Jesus Christ that he couldn't even carry that cross beam and say that he was weak. Or they would say that he was, he was, he was killed now, this is something that the apostles preached later on, that it was the Jews that killed Jesus Christ. But if we look, look at the words of Jesus Christ, we see nobody took his life from him. He gave it up on his own accord. Amen. He gave it up willingly. And that is not weakness, church. That is the greatest kind of love you will ever find. Because there is no greater love than someone who would lay down his life for his friends. That's not weakness. We saw the humbleness of Jesus Christ on the cross to bring us to our knees to make us humble. We saw the obedience of Jesus Christ on the cross that we would look to Him and in turn become obedient as well. We saw the fulfillment of all Scripture that came before fulfilled on the cross, and that is power. That's not weakness. And there was even more that was going to be fulfilled in church. I'm telling you good news this morning. He said He's coming back. And you know what He did? On the third day, He came back. But even then, He tells us today that He will be back soon. We know the beginning and we know the end. We know that Jesus Christ stands victorious today. Amen. So what the, what, what the world sees as foolish is wiser than anything that they could ever try to comprehend because His ways are higher than our ways. And what the world sees as weakness is greater strength than we could ever comprehend because His ways are higher than our ways. And His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. And when Jesus was on that cross, in great power, forgiving the ones who put Him there, you and I were on his mind in that prayer of forgiveness. Because you better believe it was our sin that put him there. For the believer, it is power. Oh, what strength it takes to stand silent before your accusers. And what great strength it takes to lay down your life for your friends. That is power. I'm going to ask the team to come back up as they are going to lead us in one more song. I'm going to ask this morning that if you would, where you are sitting, close your eyes and bow your heads, that we would go to the Lord.
in a state of reverent prayer and reflection on the words that have been spoken. As you are praying, take a moment to reflect on the power of the cross. For it was there that God's power was shown to accomplish, as Paul is getting at in verse 22 here, to accomplish what man could not. To fulfill what man could not. It was in that power that He destroyed the wisdom of the wise. That the things of this world are wiped away because it is God's power. And it is in God's power that the wisdom of this world cannot stand on its own feet. It was there at the cross in the power of God that sin was defeated, accomplishing what man could not. We could not uphold the law, but instead, man is more willing to change God's law to their own wisdom that they could uphold it and bring salvation to themselves. But that is not the gospel. We are not salvation. We are not truth. It is the work of Jesus Christ in His blood that we find salvation. And it is in Jesus Christ that we find truth. For He is the truth. To say that we are salvation and that we are truth, that is foolishness. And it has no feet to stand on in the power of God. It was on the cross that God's power brought about reconciliation. That that chasm that we sing of in that song no longer existing because it was in the word and work of the cross that Jesus brought us back into good standing with God Almighty our Father in heaven I can stand before you this morning to testify to the fact that the blood of Christ on the cross And the power of God shown in all wisdom then and there is greater than all of the empty claims of this world. It is the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross and the power of God that speaks righteousness for me and it stands in my defense that the foolishness of the world will not bring us down, church. That the foolishness of the world cannot tear us down when our foundation is the cross. But what they have done is they've turned it into a fashion piece and a wall decor. And that is not what it is meant to be. This morning... This morning, we know, and you have heard, that the cross is the power of God. You have heard the word of God spoken. Respond. It is time to respond. Pray where you are sitting. If you need someone to pray with, I'm going to ask Jerry to come forward. I will be stepping aside to prepare myself for a baptism. Jerry is here that if you need someone to pray with you, this is a good man right here. He's not wise. On his own account. This man knows people and he knows trouble.
and He knows the kind of things that people deal with because I've seen this man go through it. And He knows the power of the cross, the power of the blood. If you need someone to pray with you, to pray over you, Jerry will be right here. I'm going to step aside. If you don't know the words to pray, allow this wonderful song to be your prayer. As we turn to the cross, we turn to the power, the blood of Jesus Christ on that old rugged cross.